Dear friends, it's been nine respinas over the last two months. We have discussed various topics involving nearly about 40 panelists, more than dozen of experts and moderators all across India and with wonderful inputs, insights and learnings. We continue our journey. I thank you all for joining in and also request you to keep tuned and keep joining and keep enjoying this Respinars and be a part of this Respinar by being not only as a faculty but also as a delegate in each and every episode. ACS, hi, Richa, welcome you all for this evening Respinar yet another in the series of interventional pulmonology. So today we are going to discuss with a lead expert, Dr. Ravindra Mehta, who will be, and Deeksha will be moderating the session. Today we are going to discuss about the in, role of interventional pulmonology in parenchymal lung disease. We have a fleet of very young and dynamic uh, panelists over here. And uh, before I hand it over to De Deeksha, I would like to uh, thank our knowledge partner, Glenmark Pharmaceutical, for providing us this platform where we can exchange our ideas and we could spread <laughs> the word of knowledge and the, uh, about the intervention pulmonology. Uh, over to you, Deeksha. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, so first of all, I would like to uh, show my gratitude to Indian Chess Society for starting such a series of uh, respinas so that we can keep ourselves uh, updated. Uh, today's uh, respinar is actually is in continuation uh, of the previous one. That was the interventional pulmonology in airway disorders. And the topic for today's respinar is role of interventional pulmonologies in per uh, parenchymal lung disease. So as we all must come across such patients where we got sometimes stuck, the lesion is in parenchyma and uh, with our clinical and radiological and even with our basic uh, bronchoscopy, we are unable to reach a diagnosis or treat such patients. So they many times they become, this becomes a challenge. And there are many upcoming modalities to uh, which can assist in uh, diagnosing such patients. And uh, this is a rapidly evolving field, but still the data is not much and there are no clear-cut guidelines or uh, recommendation uh, uh, to choose we should which uh, modality should we opt for so in this term this uh, respinar is of much importance and uh, so uh, now i would like to uh, welcome our uh, panelist uh, and our uh, chief uh, lead expert sorry and the first panelist is dr lavleen mangla uh, he is a senior consultant and chief interventional pulmonologist, Metro Group of Hospital, Noida, and Faridabad. Uh, next, we have uh, Dr. V. Nagarjuna Matru, and he's a consultant and head of pulmonology, Yashoda Hospital, Hyderabad. Then we have Dr. Naveen Dutt, additional professor and head department, pulmonary medicine, Ames, Jodhpur. Now, our fourth pan panelist has not joined yet, and our lead expert, uh, uh, Sir Dr. Ravindra Mehta, he's a senior consultant and interventional pulmonologist, head Apollo Hospital, Bangalore. So I welcome you all, and uh, I welcome all our audience in this uh, today's respinar. So I guess we should start. And uh, my first question uh, will be to Dr. Lavleen. So the first question is, what are the various uh, parenchymal lung diseases where uh, we should uh, opt for these or we should consider these uh, interventional modalities when we should refer or we should go for these interventional modalities? There are basically more of a diagnostic approaches for, um, uh, but we require these interventional procedure. The first thing is uh, for uh, you can do a radial ebus. Radial ebus basically for your any consolidation, any masses or any nodules and uh, pneumonia or something like that that is persisting. Another uh, modality is, is basically cryobiopsies, which you can do for consolidations, nodules also, plus your interstitial lung disease, which can act as a replacement for surgical lung biopsies. These are the two main procedures in which um, procedures which we can use for different different modalities, diseases. 
So if I should concise, then basically there are two types of the diseases, the interstitial lung diseases, diffuse parenchymal lung diseases, where we could not get the uh, diagnosis despite our other uh, clinical and radio radiological modalities. And other is the uh, peripheral parenchymal uh, lesions, like uh, they can be nodule, they can be masses or consolidation, whatever. Uh, so, okay, thank you. Um, uh, my next question is to Dr. Uh, Nagarjuna. Uh, uh, in case of diffuse, first of all, we'll be discussing diffuse parenchymal lung disease. Uh, in case of diffuse per, uh, parenchymal lung disease, can you tell me what are the indications for going for these interventions and what is the role of uh, transbronchial cryobiopsy? <laughs> Yes, so when we have a person with DPLD, I think the role of intervention comes in only when your clinical radiological diagnosis is not very clear. I think that is the first thing I would say. For example, if you have a person with a clear-cut UIP in a smoker, then obviously your diagnosis would be IPF and you wouldn't want to do any sort of a procedure in that person. Similarly, if you have a typical exposure history and typical ground glass nodules in a central lobular pattern, you would label it as subacute HP, you wouldn't want a diagnosis. Or if you have a young lady with who is a known case of CTD presenting with ILD, again, you wouldn't want to do a biopsy. So the role of intervention is when you have an undiagnosed DPLD. That is the first thing I would uh, say. Then when you have an undiagnosed DPLD, what all can you do? So you can, there, there, have, there, there is data on utility of BAL in diagnosis of BPLD, then various types of biopsy techniques, starting from the conventional forceps biopsy, cryobiopsy, and the surgical biopsy. So as far as the biopsy is concerned, uh, I think at our center and at many centers across the globe, for most DPLDs, I think the current modality of choice is cryobiopsy. Earlier, it used to be the BATS biopsy or the surgical biopsy, but now I think there is enough data to say that cryobiopsy has a yield as good as a surgical biopsy, but with the lesser complications and lesser mortality. So cryobiopsy has taken over uh, VAT surgical biopsy as the investigation of choice when you have an undiagnosed DPLD. Now, the conventional forceps biopsy also has its role. For example, if you have a patient with sarcoid or you have a ILD which is supposedly bronchiolocentric, organizing pneumonias, pulmonary alveolar proteinosis, or a sarcoid where you're suspecting a sarcoid, then even a conventional transbronchial lung biopsy also will give you a diagnosis. You don't have to actually do a crab biopsy, though crab biopsy may have a better yield. So I think every biopsy has its role, but the predominant modality which we use nowadays is the cryobiopsy. I think this is how I would put it. I think here at, the, at this question, I think we can take the opinion of other panelists also. Yes, yes. Definitely. I think Dr. Naveen can pitch in like, or yes, Naveen Mehta sir can, can, can summarize what I have said. In indications per se or uh, in uh, as a modality? So when uh, we are discussing a case of IRD, First of all, we see the clinical and radiological profile of the patient and normally we divide the patient into either into UIP or into probable UIP or <clears throat> uh, uh, either uh, unclassifiable ILD or, or it's like showing feature of some other ILD. So in case of UIP, when uh, there is no other clinical feature which is pointing towards any other diagnosis, normally we don't need a biopsy. So straightforward, we can make a radiology, uh, the clinical radiological diagnosis and we can start the treatment of the patient. In case of the probable UIP, in probable UIP, what happens? Uh, there are certain people who have clinical profile of UIP and, they're, they're, and then there might be people, the, even in other ILDs like HP and NSIP, the probable UIP pattern can be seen. So if the clinical profile meets that of UIP, the IPF, then we might not go for uh, uh, any any kind of biopsy, and we can make a, a, a high confidence diagnosis of of UIP. But if uh, say the patient is maybe uh, having some exposure history, maybe young age, uh, we might like to biopsy. The cryobiopsy is the is the as uh, Dr. Navajna said, 
ki is the the procedure of choice nowadays but when we are differentiating we are trying to diagnose ipf or or trying to differentiate ipf from nsip the cryo biopsy may not be essentially the the procedure of of choice because uh, we need to have uh, 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 low power views the histopathological uh, uh, feature we might need to see so then we need to decide whether the patient is fit or not and in most of the cases still the procedure stays the cryo biopsy and if a patient is showing the features of any other ild then and 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 the even the clinical profile say hp the patient is having exposure showing the ct uh, uh, specific to uh, hp and bar lymphocytosis is there we might not need need biopsy and in in most of the other cases we might need biopsy so that is uh, uh, my take on the on the indications in ilds now i would like to ask uh, ravin mehta sir please uh, if you want to add something no so thanks first of all thanks for calling me here and the title lead expert is very loaded it means probably been around too long to have lovely people here uh, the the full gen next is sitting here with us so to put it into perspective to add to the points raised by nagarjun and navin it's when when you're a clinician you basically have a need to have an action plan in ild the action plan is four steps as per literature a clinical do i is it a I, it's an ild as per clinical criteria then majorly comes radiological in that so these two are clubbed together and you arrive at a diagnosis of ild literature says where now the deviate from india you must put this in the context of an mdd which means a bunch of smart people so you know three heads equal to six turn and say a i have a diagnosis if you have a diagnosis the algorithm and the decision tree of ild comes to a halt you go on the treatment pathway if that mdd which is a bunch of wise men sitting together says we don't have an answer then comes the show stopper which is biopsy literature says western literature says that biopsy percentage is 30% that even a bunch of smart people uh, sitting together may not be able to make a diagnosis in 30% slightly old literature which may be modified with better reading and then after you do the biopsy the question that comes down when you decide to do a biopsy the question that comes down to is which biopsy which nagarjun uh, talked about it's a decade long story a fascinating story of the twiddle between a to biopsy or no and then which biopsy to do which can be talked about after you do the biopsy the your job is not done you come back to the bunch of wise people the mdd and then try to close the diagnosis so this is the decision tree out there and those are the inflection points that's literature now shift to india a unique land with its own mindset in the in this in our country since first of all people will uh, you know may or may not follow the guideline that's one but if you follow the guideline you may or may not have first belief faith or access to a biopsy or you may say that you're so good at your clinical and radiology that you will take away the need for biopsy so that becomes a off thing and those people will never do a biopsy they will end the story with an mdd for those people who have access to biopsy have expertise in a biopsy and diksha i'm sure you'll cover all the nuances of why do a biopsy Uh, then you will go ahead and do the biopsy and put it in the context of the MDD. So this is where we stand at that point. So literature, I think at least if I'm not mistaken, 200 papers have come this time uh, by now, which have between review articles, proper articles, and sub dissecting all of them, which try to substantiate this way. So this is where we stand at this point. So if I'm a newbie, I'm great at clinical radiology. I will try and make a diagnosis. I can't. I will proceed with the biopsy, come back to the MDD, and try and close the diagnosis. <clears throat> so if uh, i want to concise then as you have already told us if we are not able to make the diagnosis then yes if there is a confusion then you should opt for biopsy so dr lovelyn i want to ask you what are the complications that are associated with the uh, cryo biopsy and versus other modalities like surgical biopsy or uh, transbronchial uh, normal transbronchial biopsy what are the comparison between these modalities in terms of complications and so if we compare cryo biopsy first of all with the surgical lung biopsies the days uh, the complication rates are very very less in uh, surgical lung biopsies definitely patient will be requiring intubation plus around 5 to 7 days of hospital stay one or two icds in the uh, pleural cavity chances of your infection post operative complications pain trauma everything will be there in cryo biopsy the main complication which we all fear is the bleeding 
and which can be easily controlled if you are using a any airway in, in a type of rigid bronchoscope or any ETT. Plus, if you are using a Fogarty catheter or any balloon catheter, just to stop any massive bleeding if it occurs. In our experience, like we have done around one more than 125 cases of cryobiases only in ILDs. And what we have found, five to six cases of bleeding, which are easily controlled with the, any Fogarty catheter. In only one case, we had a massive bleeding. It was my fellow mistake. Only that Fogarty catheter slipped down there. Otherwise, bleeding can be easily controlled. Yes, pneumothorax is a complication which can be seen around 1-2% to 2 of the cases. And we have found only two cases of the pneumothorax. Both of these cases of pneumothorax required any ICD insertion in these cases. But if you compare with the surgical lung biopsies, the pneumothorax rates in which in surgical lung biopsies, all patients will be requiring an ICD insertion. Compared to your uh, cryopapsies, ICD insertion is required in around 1 to 2 percent of the cases. And if you are using in your CRM or your fluoroscope, then chances of that pneumothorax can also be substantially decreased. Compared to, it is also matter like your, where you are taking the biopsies also. If you are taking from the periphery part or if you are taking at a one centimeter only proximal to your pleural, uh, sorry, visceral pleura, then chances of pneumothorax decreases further. So overall, if I say the cryotherapy, cryobiopsies complications are very, very few. In around our experience, we have not seen any mortality. And if you see any literature, Western literature, total data, mortality rate of cryobiopsy is only 0.1 to 0.6% in all the studies. So I would say the cryobiopsy is quite a safe procedure. If we compare it with your transbronchial lung biopsies, a transbronchial lung biopsy is the bleeding very, very less. And uh, I have not seen any major bleeding, but yes, it can be there. Pneumothorax rates are also almost similar to cryobiopsy and all those things. So overall, cryobiopsy gives you much better diagnostic uh, tissue. The, you can interpret it very well. So chances of your uh, getting a diagnosis are much better. Yes, expertise is an issue. Many of the people in the training is uh, available at few centers. So that is an issue with the cryobiopsy. The instruments are a bit expensive also. So these are the things which we need to consider. But if uh, you ask me about the complication, if you compare with the surgical lung biopsies, definitely complications are very, very few. But if you compare with the transbronchial lung biopsies, complication, I will say just similar to transbronchial lung biopsies. Thank you. So I will ask the almost similar question to Naveen, sir. What uh, you will uh, uh, want to add additionally, what you should do as a technical aspect to decrease these complications? What precautions you should take before the procedures, during procedure and after procedure in the technically uh, you would want to sir, add something? I think Dr. Lavine has uh, answered the question. I don't think I don't have anything to add now. <laughs> uh, uh, sir, Ravindra Mehta, sir, if anything. Yeah, so the interesting part is that, again, as I said, ad nauseum study of uh, cryo complications, t uh, TB, I mean, uh, transmuncle biopsy complications. Basically, as, uh, as uh, Lavlin was saying, it's uh, uh, three things, uh, hypoxemia, bleeding, and uh, pneumothorax. Bleeding and pneumothorax take center stage. Bleeding has been variously classified. Now we get more technical and more complex, but it's interesting. Mild, moderate, and severe. Mild is something we shouldn't be talking about in this webinar. Moderate is something which you basically get a little tachycardia and severe bleeding is something which is more than 50 to 100 ml, which changes the status of the patient and makes you wonder why you did the biopsy. So in that is to put a little a funny spin into it. Pneumothorax is also of two types. Pneumothorax, which is uh, not of any consequence, but pneumothorax, which leads to cardiorespiratory issues, need for uh, extended hospital stay or healthcare requirement and chest tube. This is what is there. So when you dissect the science over there. Uh, Transbronchial biopsy, interestingly, we used to look at complications. Each one of them comes to 1 to 1.2%. And in a recent paper last two years, they've compared head to head. They put a 4.5 to 4.7% number on collective complications of transbronchial biopsy in interstitial lung disease. For whatever reason you do it, which Nagarjun has talked about earlier. Cryo became interesting. We started with drastic numbers initially. It used to be as much as, you know, a 30% risk of pneumothorax. And that was largely related to what Lavlin said. Uh, you try to get as much tissue as you can and you want pleura. The original, so why should we look at pleura? And I'm digressing here, but it's just building up the discussion. 
you're looking at plura for a single entity called uip ipf that if you want to diagnose uip ipf and you want to talk of that magic word sub plural it means you need plura so the original founders of cryobiopsy venerino politi and others went crazy and they had around a 25% yield and plura in their samples more conservative and milder fellows like us did not match that and so we had much lesser over there so if you get plura in a large amount then you are one of the stronger fellows then your bio, your pneumothorax rate can be as much as 20 to 30% and you will proudly say that i got pneumothorax that much but i got plura but my pneumothorax rate is less than a vats virus which is 100% but now to take this interesting spin and put it into contemporary literature the pneumothorax rate is 9 to 10% requiring chest tube is 4 to 5% that is a global number based on multiple meta analysis looking at cryobiopsy so that doesn't make it sound so bad and that is very acceptable uh, and especially when you look at the 4.7 incidence of uh, of uh, transbronchial biopsy bleeding also has been comparatively a little more around 4 to 5% and most of them it is controllable now all these are mature centers doing proper procedures who are reporting them and worthy of getting into a trial if i am a newbie then obviously my incidence will be higher lastly another interesting thing came out in literature they defined this newbie versus experienced center and the number is 70 over there they took centers less than 70 and more than 70 turns out more than 70 cryobiopsy experience centers have actually taken down their complication rate to less than 50% of less experience centers so experience uh, your modality your aggressiveness to get plura and your patient selection by and large decides all these things lastly it is going to be hospitalization or no so that is related to multiple things which opens up a fresh discussion how do i do cryobiopsy flexible rigid and so on i'm sure that's going to come up as more interesting aspects for my uh, colleagues to dwell on so we'll stop over there but that summarizes the complications last word if i can put in is death since we have to tell patients about death 0.6% is the number at this point the 0.6% chance of dying in cryobiopsy and it's not related to procedure only it's related to selection whom you take up how you do the procedure what complications you face and your post uh, procedure complication management so that is a long nutshell of what we're trying to talk about so oh, thank you sir so basically there are two main complications pneumothorax and uh, bleeding as ravindra mehta sir has already told that we should avoid that sub plural uh, space uh, then only we can decrease the risk of uh, pneumothorax again the expertise is the main experience basically experience to handle all the things now coming to um, I, uh, dr uh, nagarjuna i want to ask you uh, whether uh, there is any effect of uh, freeze time or there are some other factors like there are two size of probes or there is what should be the adequate freeze time whether they affect the complication rate or uh, a yield whether they affect the yield see in as far as a cryobiopsy is concerned the, the, there are a lot of variables which are actually variable in the sense uh, uh the type of probe you want to use the amount of uh, freeze time you want to use the number of samples you want to take the number of segments you want to sample the number of lobes you want to sample so there are a lot of things which i think you won't have one answer as to this is the best so now come start talking about each one of these uh, if we talk about the size of cryo probe earlier it was easier because we only had 2.4 and 1.9 now company is uh, coming up with 1.7 now it has come up with 1.1 also so basic thing is that smaller the size of cryoprobe smaller the piece you get smaller the piece lesser the complications smaller the piece lesser the diagnosis this is probably how it is so when we do a cryobiopsy for a dpld we normally use a 1.9 which we are very happy with or a 1.7 so 1.1 also people have done but we feel that 1.1 will get a smaller tissue so we use 1.9 most of our cases where the uh, studies which have compared 1.9 2.4 2.4 definitely gets a bigger tissue but at a higher risk of complications then uh, the freeze time so what is the freeze time i think it is not it cannot be uniform more important is the size of sample you get i think we should target on the sample size 
So an ideal cryo biopsy sample is at least five millimeters in uh, diameter, at least at least five, roughly around that range. So what we normally do is first we start the first biopsy at probably around five seconds of one point nine. We look at the size we get. If the size is smaller, we will go up to six, seven, eight seconds also. And if the size is uh, adequate, then we will stick to five seconds of uh, activation. But there is also now some data coming up that if you use a 1.1 cryopro, probably 12 seconds of activation of 1.1 is equivalent to roughly around five seconds of 1.9. So I think it is the size which is more important for us. So longer you freeze, longer will be bigger will be the bigger size be of size. Uh, biopsy you get. Yes, that is the freeze times. Then third thing is the number of pieces. Again, there is there is paper as Dr. Ravi Mehta sir was telling by Dr. Poleti and other groups also as to how to optimize the yield. Um, is there any minimal number of pieces which you have to get? Again, there are so many papers, review articles, several guidelines from different societies. Uh, most of them have given different numbers. Some say at least two, some say at least four. Again, that would depend upon the size. So at our center, what we do is we target for 5 mm biopsies and we take try to take at least four biopsies. But it is said that you have to have at least two, not less than two, preferably more. So four is what we normally do. Sometimes we even go up to six, but four is what I feel is correct. I think other experts also can pitch in and share their experiences on how they do the biopsies. And the last thing is the number of segments. Uh, because it's a DPLD, obviously you will have many segments which are obviously involved. So we, we usually take from as many segments as we can, two or more segments and from two loops whenever possible. So this is what uh, we follow at our center. But I think it would be also interesting to hear what other, other centers follow. The question is open to the other panelists if they want to add. So again, the 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 bare minimum is uh, two segment or uh, two biopsies, but it depends on the 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 the, uh, the condition of the patient and what the diagnosis you are considering. If you are you are considering IPF, one of the possibility, then we need more biopsy specimen. So so there are many factors which decide the the number of of the uh, biopsy specimens required. But we do like in. At our center, but we do, we do so initially we take two samples and we just see what is the size of the samples. If it is more than five mm square, then we stop the biopsy at that level. If la small, many pieces small, then we go for the third sample also and sometimes fourth sample also. Another thing which uh, I also found uh, while like if we are uh, targeting any area which is more of GGO or of consolidation, then we chances of getting a uh, bigger tissue in the same duration is more compared to if you are hitting a fibrotic area. I would like to hear your experiences also, sir. Uh, I guess you are asking Talwar, sir, maybe? Ravind Mehta, sir. No. <laughs> Ravind okay. Mehta, sir, or Dr. 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 Nagarjuna. Okay, okay, okay. So, uh, sir, you want to add something? Yeah, we say everybody is eagerly waiting to hear from you. <laughs> Oh, I was wondering who Sir was. So, so I think yeah. the pieces and all also. So now we're getting more interesting, guys. For the listeners, we're getting into the minute the nitty gritty of cryo. Each part is being dissected, and that's the interesting part because ultimately each one of these things leads to safety, success, and ultimately a diagnosis, which is the point of this entire uh, exercise of biopsy. So, in fact, on a side note, we have tried to coin this term called value addition of biopsy, VAB. That when you decide to do a biopsy, you have to put all these things in. The risk-benefit analysis, the consequences of your clinical radiological MDD, what you're going to do with the biopsy, are you going to combine that with the lavage, which is the question in the chat box and will be taken up later. Are you going to determine the inflammatory and fibrotic component? And what are you going to do after that? So if you ask yourself these five, six questions, I think you stand on firmer ground to both why we're doing it, how we're going to do it, and if there's any complications, how do we deal with it? So coming back to number of pieces, lobes and all, that's a detailed science. Bottom line is that the conclusion came that three and above leads to an uh, accurate diagnosis. And this is for all comers, which has to be customized as per the 
pre-test probability and the initial MDD diagnosis on what you're looking for. The second is multi-lobar versus multi-segment in one lobe. Multi-lobar is desirable based on what Lovelin said. It's a careful part, just like we used to do batch biopsy. Just like we used to do batch biopsy and sit with the surgeon and say, what area are you going to biopsy? Similarly, here you'll be deciding more specifically which segment and which lobe you want to go for. Multi-lobar desirable, but more complications and slightly more difficult. So often you wind up trying to do multi-segment unilobar. And uh, if you do that, then you can target a mix of GGO and fibrosis areas. Only fibrotic areas, as lovely said, may not add to it. But this is based on the fact that you looked at it very carefully. So that is the, uh, the low part of it. The size of probe, as Nagarjun was trying to point out, choice leads to confusion sometimes. Now that also has been looked at carefully. 1.1, 1.7, not so desirable. 1.9 is an old guard which has been tested and has good uh, yield. Uh, 2.4 also was looked at uh, recently in a systematic paper. They tried to, 2.4 we always thought was too large, too much, and being complication averse, we were avoiding it. But turns out 2.4 will give you more pieces. And in these experienced hands in this publication led to no extra increase in bleeding on pneumothorax. So that is there in literature to be tested by each one of you, depending on your, on your personal preference. The thing between the probe size and bleeding pneumothorax also is partly what we reflected. You go far out and you get pleura, you will get more pneumothorax and less bleed. You come a little more proximal and you get less pleura, you will get more bleed and less pneumothorax. So you have to take your pick. And sometimes in your four pieces, you're going to do two of each. So you will have both bleeding and pneumothorax. So this is what you have to deal with. Uh, the addition of lavaginol can be discussed separately. Uh, in terms of freeze time, as Nagarjun was trying to say, eight, 8 seconds, 6 seconds, anything more than 6 seconds is recommended for the 1.9 and 2.4 probes. We would like to think that the freeze time correlates with the size of the tissue. Probably not. Probably not. There's nothing to show that. What we know is that at least 6 seconds and not your 6 seconds counted by a, a, a person who's trying to get a cryobiopsy done fast. The machine actually has a count of seconds and you will have to take it out at that point. That should lead to good tissue. Probably the freeze time in isolation cannot be considered. It's to be considered with where are you, peripheral, fibrotic area, GGO area and so on. So it may vary from patient to patient. So once you dissect this, you've looked at probe, which is what you're going to pick up from the outside. Then you put it inside and you decide where you're going. That subplural versus a little more proximal. Then you decide basically that I'm going to freeze for so much time. Then you try to repeat the procedure for X number of pieces. And then ultimately this is the end. And then you decide whether you're going a multi-segment, uh, unilobar or multilobar. So once all these five, six points come in, you have basically cracked the procedure for all the questions, which is required to do something of this magnitude. Okay, so I hope uh, we have covered everything, almost everything about cryobiopsy. If anyone wants to add some specific point, then you are most welcome. Maybe you can add Lavaj, I mean, Nagarjun or the other team members yes. to comment on the role yeah, of Yeah, there is a question of role of bowel fluid cytology in diagnosing ILD. Yeah. Basic uh, yeah, interventions, yeah, what uh, we so usually do. Uh, I would just add, it depends on the center, because I think there are the countries where people are not biopsy uh, uh, favoring they do more of lavage but we don't we usually depend more on the biopsy because when we can get the tissue and see the tissue then definitely it, it gives more value over a lavage so lavage in ild i think it has spe certain indications one is uh, in specific diseases like proteinosis yes lavage will help us or uh, or mainly in ruling out infections we have a proven case of ild you want to rule out infection, then yes, lavage has a role. But what about bowel lymphocytosis and uh, helping in diagnosis, as was being discussed by Dr. Naveen also, whether uh, lymphocytosis will favor a diagnosis of HP over UIP, lack of lymphocytosis will rule out uh, HP. All of these questions, there is no one clear answer. So we usually depend more on histopathology than bowel per se. That is what uh, I personally feel. Only when you cannot do a biopsy or centers where they do not have experience in biopsy, I think there uh, you may rely on bal rather than doing nothing. 
yes basically to rule out uh, infections and just to get a plus one if you cannot do biopsy then they can just add yes this is the diagnosis this is your provisional diagnosis they can just add uh, in the diagnosis okay. if i can add a small point diksha so it's all yes, not sir. the mix now when we talk of this value addition of biopsy suppose you are confused a little uh, which way to go should i start anti anti inflammatory anti fibrotic should i go staggered should i go you know what agent to use then a good well done lavage with a with a proper lymphocytosis can help you quite a bit uh, as a tie breaker so again it is the conservative the semi conservative and the aggressive the aggressive will get more tissue and depend less on the lavage the semi conservative are those reluctant fellows who agreed in the last two, two guidelines to put cryobiopsy in and they will say in some patients you can just get a lavage and make sure hp and so on just get a lavage look for this uh, you know marker that marker and now machine learning is coming in the recent machine learning models they're trying to show that a lavage and plus minus a tbb put into a machine uh, ai again algorithms will be uh, pretty good at diagnosing uip so it may this discussion may change after a year as these machine learning models come in um and then there is absolute conservative who will say that we do only a lavage and look for an inflammatory signal because ultimately your decision is to start anti inflammatory anti fibrotic or both so it can add to it and when you sit in an mdd often you lean on to that the second role of a lavage may be when you are following up you know you've done your stuff you're giving therapy or you've inherited a patient from somewhere else and it's not easy to put them through all this often the decision tie breaker between microcystic honeycombing looking like ggo how to trick this Uh, should we give the benefit of uh, anti-inflammatory if you are scientific? Otherwise, you can throw in everything at the same time. Uh, then these things can be quite useful. So a lot of literature is trying to look at the roles of all these things. So you have these tools with you. You have a you have nothing, a brilliant mind and an MDD. You have a lavage only. You have all of them plus a lavage and a TBB. And now you're throwing in machine learning algorithms. And then you have cryo. And then we have the disappearing guard of surgical lung biopsy. okay so, so now in, uh, yeah. in yes, our sir. center the most uh, common ild we encounter is uh, uh, hp so in that particular setup of patients now even the the guidelines also say you don't need to have biopsy in all the patient for the high confidence diagnosis so even if if there is a clear cut history of exposure and uh, if the radiology is also typical it is not suggestive of any other disease a bar lymphocytosis can can help uh, make diagnosis without any biopsy and uh, and and very importantly the other roles the bar plays is to rule out infection and and diffuse alveolar hemorrhage in the in the right context moreover one more issue is with the bar is like i can if i get a bar more than 30% maybe 40% lymphocyte then we can say it is a hp or something like that but i cannot say to the patient once we'll do the bronchoscopy bar lymphocyte if it comes positive nothing okay fine we can diagnose you with con good confidence with the hp and if it does not come negative then we'll do another procedure with the biopsy in india it is sometimes very much difficult so most of the times what we do we do a bar uh, bar in the same patient then do the biopsies also bar definitely adds up some value but uh, not for all the patients like and it cannot be very much you know diagnostic for all the patients and i cannot uh, send my patient for two two bronchoscopies in a you know within a week or like that just to make a diagnosis okay so coming to the next section that is the peripheral parenchymal lesion and i would like to ask this question from navin sir uh how do we define peripheral parenchymal lesions and what are the interventional these are some new interventional modalities that should be now we can choose to increase the yield in such lesions so there is a, a no clear cut definition regarding these peripheral lesions so grossly the lesions in the the peripheral one third of the lung uh we call the peripheral lesions but the issue is the landmark they have not been established that for 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 seeing the one third will take this as middle point and this this as the lateral point so grossly the the lesions in the the outer one third of the lung they are the peripheral lesions and now the primary modality which we use is is radial probe ebus and the the advantage of radial probe ebus is that we can we can we can uh, localize the lesion we can see the lesion and then then the core beam navigation is also coming where we can see the lesion in two dimension that 
the our needle is is there in the in the lesion only then there are uh, na the uh, navigation techniques like the virtual navigation the electromagnetic navigation and robotic these these all help in navigating the 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 wfc forcer to the to the lesion so i would uh, like to say that peripheral parenchymal lesions are the lesions which we cannot reach with our normal adult or uh, normal daily uh, routine basic bronchoscopy yeah. if we cannot reach there so dr lovelin can you uh, tell us something about a uh, thin and ultra thin bronchoscopy what are their added with advantage over the normal routine adult bronchoscopy so ultra thin bronchoscopies are the bronchoscopy basically which we say the outer diameter is less than 4 mm and uh, their internal diameter can be from 1.5 to 2 mm and if it can be more than that what makes ultra thin bronchoscopy good is the distance to the lesion decreases a lot as dr navin already told the outer or the peripheral one third of the lesion we can go to the sub segmental bronchus to this because for an earlier bronchoscope which we had the routine conventional bronchoscope we can go up to the segmental bronchoscope but with this ultra thin bronchoscope we can go to the sub segmental our reach decreases and definitely if we'll go distal more and more bronchus bronchi will open up and we can put our radial levers in each and every bronchi bronchi second another issue there is an issue with the ultra thin bronchoscopy is their suction capability as the internal diameter is less so chances the suction level decreases and sometimes when we go into the distal bronchus we may not be able to visualize these bronchus properly and this happens a lot so if you have a good internal diameter like uh, of uh, 2 mm or more than that then chances that suction capability will be more and you will be able to do it a good procedure but if internal diameter is less then chances of doing a good procedure is less so we can compare we basically they try to differentiate it with their pediatric bronchoscope with this internal diameter only and uh, if internal diameter is better then they are calling is the ultra thin bronchoscope but if we have smaller smaller bronchoscope like neonatal and pediatric one but their internal diameter is small so this is the just a one way to differentiate from them but yes definitely it uh, helps in reaching towards the lesion we can do more procedures but suction is an issue with these procedure and with these ultra thin bronchoscope what is your opinion what is your take on the answer sir are these ultra thin bronchoscopy if i want to say they can add a loan there are other modalities which we can add to increase the yield but alone they are of any help or not well basically the whole thing comes down to technology helping you in situations where uh, the lesion is actually endobronchial but you can't take your scope that far so you just basically increase your vision out there uh, that what you could see for till uh, fourth fifth generation bronchus you can take till seventh generation so suddenly you find that you reach there and this was actually endobronchial lesion that's the biggest advantage of ultra thin bronchoscopy the second is the curvatures that we know that the lung is uh, challenging when it comes to sampling ppms in different areas and often in the upper lobes in especially close to the hilum you'll not be able to easily uh, we get this, the the bronchoscope to curve so ultra thin curves very well so if you want to put a tool to that you can now talking of working channel uh, thanks to again it's all technology uh, you may also have an ultra thin with a decent working channel of 2 mm in which case uh, and if you are uh, sitting in the west and you have a radial probe of 1.4 then it becomes a, a higher technological tool by using a smaller scope going distally at the same time using a thinner radial which can go through it and both of these together can curve and go to areas which the routine bronchoscope cannot flex into so this is by and large the advantage at this point then there are others which come to the moment you go to technologically more advanced procedures which i'm sure you'll talk about navigation and so on there's a different role of all these things like i know there is you will be talking of robotic the robotic scope is a different scope by itself and those again technological features help us to navigate a curved a uh, bronchial tree uh, to a stage where we can actually read the lesion more effectively but for now we have uh, an ultra thin bronchoscope we have a radial ebus we have uh, a fluoroscope and more tools which i'm sure are going to be discussed uh, as this, as the session goes ahead
So I would ask uh, now, uh, Dr. Nagarjuna, can you tell us about radial probe EBUS, how uh, it helps in uh, identification of the these lesions and how it helps in increasing the yield? Yeah, I think radial probe EBUS is one thing which has actually revolutionized our uh, bronchoscopic approach to peripheral lesions. So it's all like pre-radial probe era and the post-radial probe era. So, because I think nowadays, if you want to do any sampling of a pul peripheral pulmonary lesion, it is said that you have to do it using the radial probe. Without radial probe, definitely you should not do it. So, but now radial probe, uh, how does it help? It is basically, it helps us visualize the lesion. So, basically, once you identify the lesion, mark the lesion, decide your path, take a thin or an adult or whatever scope you have close to the lesion, how do you know whether you have reached the lesion or not? That is when you put a radial probe and see the lesion. So radial probe is basically a probe which revolves. So you get an ultrasonic image of the lung or the lesion surrounding the radial probe. So this is basically to make sure that you have actually reached your target. Now, how once you reach the target, the only problem with radial probe is that it is not real time. So once you identify the lesion, again, the remaining sampling doesn't happen real time. You either leave the sheath or you use a flora and then do the sampling. So in the radial probe, the things which you have to do, how, how you can identify the lesion, the normal lung is called this no storm appearance. I don't think I can show images here. But then if you have a nodule or a mass, you see it as a hyperchoic area surrounding the probe. The important thing is your location of the probe in relation to the lesion. So if you're able to get your probe to the center of the lesion like this, then you get a concentric image. The target, your, your target is to try to get a concentric image. So you try to manipulate and see if you can get your probe into a subsegment where you get a concentric image. Because if you get a concentric image, your diagnostic yield shoots up to 85 to 90 percent. It is still not 100 percent, it goes up to 90 percent. But many times what happens is you are, sadly, you reach the lesion, but you are somewhere on the periphery. So your probe will be, suppose like this, it will be just on the peripheral part of the lesion. So you get a so-called eccentric or an adjacent image. So if you get an eccentric or an adjacent image and you try to do the conventional brush or a conventional forceps biopsy, your yield is lesser, only 50 to 60 percent. So when you have an eccentric lesion, then again, the role of a cryoprobe, either the 1.1 or sometimes the 1.7 can be used. So there is enough data now to say that if you have an eccentric where you're not able to reach the center of the lesion, then if you do a cryo, then you will probably improve your diagnostic yield. This is as far as a solid lesion is concerned. But now there is a lot of uh, data on trying to identify ground glassing, consolidation, other things also on radial ebus. So the signs like blizzard sign, mixed blizzard sign, all of these have been described. So the more you do radial ebus, the more you can identify these abnormalities. And once you identify the abnormality, you can try to biopsy. I think uh, this is very in brief about uh, radial ebus. Ravish, you want to add? No, thanks. Your experience. Okay. So, Ravind Mehta, finally, it's up to you. You want to add something? No, it's very interesting. As Nagarjun said, you know, we have in the last decade and a half uh, seen a revolution of technology around the uh, 12 technologies have come, which is so huge in, in any branch of procedure uh, of medicine. In that, radial ebus was the first way to actually get there. So the good old days, my most famous namesake, Dr. Mehta, used to go and show all sorts of fancy lesions where he would be able to curve the bronchoscope under fluoroscopy using a good knowledge of CT scan, sample it using a TB and a needle or forceps. That was the skill. Then the first visualization came with the radial ebus uh, and comp then multimodality has started off radial ebus with fluoroscopy and many more, including navigation, which uh, can be discussed. Radial EBUS at this point has been a very useful tool, but my slightly nihilistic take on it is that in the next uh, few years, we'll see the disappearance of this tool as more accurate ones come out. Or let me rephrase it. It won't disappear. It will be an add-on confirmation because now when you just peek a little and open your eyes and look into the Western world, there is a robot. 
we don't know when it will hit us and if at all it will hit us but the robo helps you to get there much better uh, you know options to the robo are other fancy modalities tbct other uh, navigation technologies and the radial ebs at this point in the western world is relegated only to confirmation of your of your uh, of the final position of your uh, uh, navigation instruments so the whole concept is now basically a uh, uh, lesion in tool in tool in lesion so that means that if your your radial ebs is going there that's tool in le uh, lesion and then when you take a biopsy has the material come into your forceps which is lesion in tool so when it comes to tool in lesion radial ebs is at this point in the advanced countries relegated to a confirmatory role but for us for the foreseeable future it is still a good diagnostic modality to try and give an additional element of objective verification of where the lesion is before you use your biopsy tools so basically radial ebs ebs helps in localization and visualization of the lesion but yes again it is not a real time uh, sampling so coming to uh, dr lovelin uh, can you tell us about some navigational uh, modalities various navi navigational mo uh, modalities and what is your experience if you have uh, some experience with that we don't have any navigation uh, this but question is actually open to all if i think dr nagarjan will be able to give better answer on this because he has an experience on navigation bronchoscopy yes definitely yeah i think there is i think na navigate as dr mehta sir was telling so there are so many companies which are coming up with their own uh, custom made uh, navigational platforms uh, so uh, whether to use a navigation or not is the first question so i think it is not that in every case you actually need a navigation so many times the ct itself will give you a reasonable idea as to uh, uh where you have to reach so the predominant role of navigation comes in smaller lesions and the peripheral lesions if it's a reasonably larger lesion i think the ct itself will give you and if somebody who is very good in uh, manual uh, airway mapping they won't actually need a uh, navigational tool also so normally we use it when the lesion is less than 2 cm we take the help of a navigational platform the first one which which we had in our country is the virtual bronchoscopic navigation also called as the lung point so it will make our job easier so basically because we don't want to spend time doing the manual airway mapping we tend to use the tool so it will significantly decrease the time taken to reach the lesion i think that is one definite advantage of uh, vb and i would uh, say also this real time synchronization and all the extra things which are there in the vbn more often than not are not used so basically you try to know where you have to go so that you actually reach the lesion faster and other than that there are e e most of the the uh, navigational platforms the cbct all the company cbct is also have their own navigational platforms now in addition to this there are dedicated navigational things like lung vision and so on and so forth i think uh we need not discuss about the pros and cons of each of these uh in addition to the airway navigation now there is something called as transbronchial access where you try to go outside the airway so some of your your navigational gadgets also give the point of entry and the path to be taken outside the airway so that is called as the transbronchial access that is going to be the next thing where you know if you don't have a bronchus leading to it you actually puncture the bronchus and go out of the bronchus and then take a biopsy so that is the other thing uh, which uh, might be coming up in the near future okay uh, sir over to you ravin mehta sir your experience no, so we will get very technical and very complex in this as nagarjun said we are opening pandora's box now at this point if you're looking at a practical approach and you can take another full webinar on navigation how to reach the lesion size location tools and like we said the, the keywords are uh, tool in lesion and lesion in tool once you know these two words it becomes very jazzy and very interesting to talk about ultimately at this point you have a keen uh, sense of ct scan very good sense of ct scan uh, uh, you go ahead and you can use the fluoroscopy only for larger lesions you can uh, uh, along with the ct scan the guidance uh, we're not going to get into augmented fluoroscopy which is what nagarjun was trying to point out 
Then you have the radial EBUS, which is an add-on. You buy a EBUS in most companies. Uh, you will get a radial EBUS tool with that that helps to get there. If you are one a very meticulous and highly uh, skilled person, like you know, you can have the Kurimoto book, and you will follow every bronchus there and try and get there. If you are not an average fellows like uh, we, you know we are, then you will try and use technology, which is either navigation tools, augmented fluoroscopy, or CBCT. And then ultimately, you will the ultimate kid on the block right now is the jazzy word robo, which has not hit our country. So suddenly, in the last three years, as COVID was, you know, uh, exercising its uh, horror on us, this science of PPL has gone very high. What we have to think is futuristically, beyond uh, diagnosis, is there more to it? One thing is in diagnosis, and we have many detractors, they will say that in the actual team, you will figure out whether you're going to do it by bronchoscopy or CT guided biopsy. Let's be very frank, because eco economy is much more in, in favor of CT guided biopsy. So that is one thing you must factor into your diagnostic algorithm. And lastly, the whole buzzword now, futuristic looking, is going to be therapeutics. The advantage of getting to a lesion is, uh, can you go ahead and do something to, to try and, and uh, you know get rid of the lesion, whether it's going to be hot therapy, cold therapy, microwave therapy, and so on. So that's where the future is headed towards. So it's become a fantastic science of what, where, how to biopsy, which modality in from the outside and from the inside, and when you go by bronchoscopy from the inside, what tool do you do to get there? What, how do you confirm your presence? What do you use to sample? And ultimately, the pathologist is telling you whether you've sampled accurately or not and putting it in the clinical context of the patient situation. So it's as personal as medicine as it can get. We're actually getting into hardcore analytical surgical areas. So uh, these navigational modalities, I guess they have just one role. If we are not able to find the pathway to reach that lesion, if then only we should go for them. And uh, uh, so the, coming to the next uh, question that uh, Sir has already uh, uh, give, given some hints, I guess uh, he will be telling more about robotics. Uh, if he wants to add something about finally the robotic assisted bronchoscopy, the latest buzz. Nagarjan, you should take this one. <laughs> so I think so because because we don't have it in our country, so I don't think that anybody will talk uh, of experience. Whatever we speak is only what other people have experienced. So robotic bronchoscopy is uh, considered the end where not not actually the end, but then it, it may actually improve the yield significantly. So it gives us the path. It, uh, it, you just play with the bronchoscope. It has a better uh, stability, more flexibility, thinner scopes. So all of these are advantages of uh, robotic bronchoscopy over uh, conventional bronchoscopy, but then you can always argue that if you have a steady hand, a thin scope, a keen eye, then you might actually do what a robot is actually doing. So it all depends on where you work, uh, how much the institute or government is providing you, how much the patient can spend and the other things. So I think uh, robotic bronchoscopy as of now uh, is a thing of the future for us. Probably 10 to 15 percent uh, increase in yield for 10 to 15 times the cost. <laughs> Definitely, all these navigation modalities cost is the major factor in a country like India. So, uh, if we can see some questions from the audience, we can see Richard already in action answering them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ma'am is already answering some question. So someone has asked, can CM or fluoroscopy helps in decreasing pneumothorax? I think uh, there is enough, there is some data to say that if you use a fluoro, you can decrease the pneumothorax. In fact, paper from our own country, uh, a TBLC in DPLD, where Dr. Mahitas are also one of the co-authors. So they had shown that uh, using a fluoro, might help uh, in decreasing the rates of pneumothorax. Uh, I think uh, if you have a flora, I think better to use. Because again, you should know whether you're using a one-dimensional or two-dimensional flora. Because one-dimensional flora always may, al always may not actually 
uh, give us the clue. So if you have a fluoro which is movable and you can you see it in two different planes, then it will be even more helpful. So somebody who's actually taking the fluoro, but you to take a fluoro which is which can see in two different planes. So if you if you are at any one plane, you are touching the pleura, touching the the chest wall. Definitely, you have to withdraw by at least five millimeters, and you can decrease the risk of um, pneumonia. That is in cryo. The role, the role of fluoro in a peripheral pulmonary lesion nodule sampling is it makes it sort of real time. As I have said, radiolibus is not real time. If you combine radiolibus with fluoro, so you can see the lesion, and once the probe is out, you you can see the on the fluoro where your gadgets are going. So normally, uh, the the basic thing which as a as an in IP so we should have is a radiolibus probe, a thin ebus, and a fluoro. The combination of these three at this point of time will help us in improving the yield for peripheral pulmonary lesions. Yeah. To add to it, uh, TBB textbook answer you can do it without fluoro. Uh, desirable answer fluoro is always nice. Also helps to teach much better. You can teach you know when you see that and you can sample segments much better. Cryo again, uh, fluoro extremely desirable and recommended. Yes, people are doing it without uh, fluoro, but again, it's strongly recommended to use fluoroscopy. And the other stuff is, as Nagarjun said, basically to avoid that, the subplural area. Yeah, so subplural area is, is all depending on who you are. You can very well go for any subplural area you want. None of us know that it leads. It is more problematic. We know that subplural area will give you more pleura. There is a slightly higher incidence of pneumothorax, but in the big picture, if the pneumothorax is manageable and that is that gives you an answer, it is acceptable to go ahead and do that. Yes, and of course, subplura, if you want to target, then as you tried to say, um, fluoro makes a lot of sense. It's impossible to talk subplural and all sorts of accurate, uh, precise terminologies and not have fluoroscopy. So more and more as we talk of, we know on one side, we're talking the extreme of navigation and so on and so forth. So fluoro, uh, though attempted to, in, in resource limited settings, we still would like to say not required. It would be an essential tool in anybody who takes up any level of intervention beyond the regular. Okay, so anyone wants to add something? I, it's already more than nine, and I guess I have completed almost all the important aspects. So I think we we're good. Just to crystallize everything, uh, it's fascinating. It's a, a, a art and a science now. So as I say that you know, it's not intervention pulmonology; it's procedure pulmonology taken in the context of patient care so as to do justice at all ends. So, you know, all of us who basically love the jazzy title of intervention pulmonology, in my personal opinion, which can be refuted, should look at it differently. Because then you, when you once you look at it differently, then you will go right from pre-test probability to what procedure, to pros and cons, to skill levels, to tools used, to what to do with the data and how to handle complications. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, what I can say is that at least seeing the scenario for the last uh, decade and a half of intervention spread in the country, uh, we've reached a revolution here. That we have, you know, uh, the science has been advanced. Of course, we have to do it responsibly. ILD has taken a new turn with uh, with the algorithms and the diagnostic aspects that looked at much more carefully. Worldwide literature has changed in front of us from saying 2018 conditional recommendation for. TBLC in ILD to now approved. There was only one detractor, and I think who it is, it's a man from Italy, I would think, who mm -hmm. said no. But otherwise, the 2022 guidelines have changed it remarkably. Subcategories are being looked at TBLC in UIP, TBLC in uh, HP. It reached the difficult part of UIP. So even in UIP, suspected UIP, when you're not sure and you decide to do biopsy, you can look at TBLC. And the same thing, the PPN science is relatively, I think, two steps behind. It is racing ahead. More, much more available information is there, but the tools are still to hit us. So lovely technology, excellent uh, uh, modalities, tons of literature, great expertise in the country. And putting it in the context of patient care would largely depend on uh, you as a clinician, um, uh, putting all these technologies to the to right responses. So that would be uh, one way to summarize this sort of uh, discussion. The nuances are what we talked about. Once you start doing it layer on layer, you try to dissect every procedure. 
so as to do it safely, accurately, and successfully. I hope I hope we have answered all the questions. And uh, with this, I would like to thank all the panelists and our lead experts. Uh, and uh, I would like to thank all the audience also. With this, thank you so much.